Hi everyone and welcome back. This is episode one of How We See It with myself Vinayak in Sekat. As we have mentioned before, we're going to be doing this regularly, virtually, primarily using either podcast or Zoom to discuss issues which are of importance both here in India as well as globally. And right now the entire globe has come together on a common issue because there is a common enemy in COVID-19 or what's also called as coronavirus. Um, we've had an expert in the previous episode, but we're lucky again to have another expert on this episode. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, you come from the Department of Biostatistics in Michigan. Written recently, a pretty positive to do. Um, and therefore, we're, we're grateful for your time and would love to hear more from you. And hopefully, the audience will also really benefit from this conversation. So, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you so much, Vinayak. Thank you so much, Saikat, for this initiative of getting the right facts out there at the right time. So uh, what I wanted to say, so uh, we just released a report in Medium and also prepared an extensive report on our own situational analysis of the COVID-19 situation. But let me give you a background, you know, so I have been um, quarantined for the last five days. I have not gone out of my uh, um, co condominium. And so, um, and, and, and I, I feel helpless. I have been uh, living in the United States uh, for the last uh, 23, 24 years, but I have never felt cordoned off from India. So my parents are still in India and there is a travel ban. I cannot go to India. So in these circumstances, and many of us here are in this situation, so we decided to channel our energy and our expertise to analyze data. So there are uh, graduate students at University of Michigan, postdocs at University of Michigan. We started this work honestly last week and we got together by blue jeans and spent many sleepless nights. I think that I have got very little sleep in order to get the report out there because most of the analysis that you have seen is after the fact. And after the fact analysis of the cases does not really change uh, the fate of a pandemic. So we wanted to get this report early and we used uh, certain standard epidemiologic tools. The methodology is quite standard, but looked at the Indian data. And the methodology was actually devised by a colleague of mine at the biostatistics department at University of Michigan. He had analyzed all the data from Hubei. So I think as much as we are in deep crisis, we also have two examples where they have turned the course of this pandemic around China and South Korea. So what can we learn from the data there? Because we are at an advantage, because we are at a lag. So what can we do and how can we prepare yours, ourselves? So that was the goal of the report. It is blended with some of the quantitative projections and there will be a lot of variation in the quantitative projections because there is uncertainty in the early phase in the numbers that you're getting. And we published the report on March 16th and then as soon as you know, we ran the model last night with data up to March 21 and the projections are much higher because you are getting more people tested and um, then the numbers are going up. So regardless of the numerical value of those estimates, the conclusions are very similar about interventions, that what we need to do and how we need to prepare for a long-term strategy and be clever about all the different types of interventions in terms of travel ban, social distancing, lockdown, uh, we are increasing our capacity of testing, all of these four in a like slightly optimized strategy should be rolled out and this can have drastic effect. And as we have seen, South Korea and China has shown us that this is not an uh, unbeatable uh, crisis, but we need to be- So, uh, so Vinayak, uh, you know, I've read some of your work and it's, it's amazing how quickly you've been able to turn it around and it's uh, remarkable. So, you know, kudos to you for that uh, and more power to you and your co-workers. I have a couple of questions. Tell us the, tell us the not so good news and tell us maybe the something positive and hopeful that we can hold on to both here in, in, in India, but also in, in the US, because as you said, we're, we have the advantage, so to speak, of a lag compared to Korea and China. Um, so those would be very important. And because you work in biostatistics and epidemiology, 
something that has, I mean, uh, something that I've been very curious about is where are the early prediction models? Where are the early warning systems? Are they none or they've not been looked at or they're just faulty? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that as a second question. So great question, Vinayak. So let me uh, answer it to you and answer this in parts. So the first thing I want to say is that um, we have data, very spotty data, because as soon as you are doing more testing, the numbers are going up. So it's hard to, so the missing piece of the puzzle, as we say in the report, is the truly affected number of cases. And the crisis point is that in terms of diagnosis and resisting and arresting community spread is the asymptomatic people who are not showing signs of symptom and are not tested and they are going about doing with their daily life and that's why this quarantine strategy for everyone because we really do not know who has the virus or not because we have not tested everybody so that's a missing piece of the puzzle but in the first part of the pandemic how south korea arrested it is actually really doing large scale testing and then contact tracing right testing and contact tracing of the exposed individual even in us in the beginning of the pandemic we were getting from our county that these are the cases and these are the areas where they have been. So anybody exposed should get tested. But then when the case number is in hundreds and thousands, that's not a feasible strategy anymore. So this is only a good strategy in the early part of the pandemic when it has spread all over, then you shift to providing more care to uh, people who are coming to the hospital. So I think the good news is that uh, the, the success of China and South Korea, right? Because we know that this, is, this, is, this can be done. And I also think that India has acted early. And I'm very proud of the government for rolling out very severe measures at a very early stage. And that was very much needed. And because with a population like India, I think draconian measures need to be taken just because of the sheer numbers that we can produce. The, Bad news is also that the people who are at the highest risk category for going to the hospital or going to the ICU, there are certain risk, char risk characteristics. For example, the elderly, people who have immune system compromise, people who are, have diabetes. We calculated in table two of our paper that that number of vulnerable people are huge in India. So it, it may end up that there is a more pressure you need to flatten the curve even more because more people have to go to the hospital. And then there's the double jeopardy because the number of hospital beds in, in India is 0.7, according to the World Bank, Bank data, per thousand people, whereas in, whereas in US it's 2.9. So if you think about these two things, that more people are coming and less beds, then it's a even like how much do you need to flatten the curve? So these draconian measures that are being taken are absolutely necessary from a mathematical and epidemiology point of view. But then also the bad news is that it's not easy to rule out these interventions because there are side effects. So we are now really talking about in our projection model in our conversation, how to control the number of coronavirus infections. But because of that, we can have secondary consequences because of these interventions that people who earn daily wages, right? So we do not want to create a socioeconomic crisis. So we need some kind of economic and social immunity before we get biologic hard immunity from this viral. So virus. So I, I strongly feel that the side effects could be, so we have to really think it in a holistic point of view and so that we can give some subsidies, some assurance to common people that they are not going to starve to death, there will be food on the table, as well as, um, you know, there may be strategies that people can go out in a, in a sort of a punctuated, modulated lockdown that people can go out for a limited number of hours, like China did, that, per, that you are allowed to go out twice. And so some kind of regimented charter that one can follow. Uh, so I think that uh, the whole, and also it has been shown that during this period of the pandemic in China, there has been excess deaths due to other comorbidities, right? Because when you are confined, there's a psychosocial effect. You are not getting probably the right nutrition. You are not getting the right exercise. You are anxious, you are stressed out. So there are other diseases, other repercussions that can happen. So if I think about an omni model, 
where you are actually incorporating all of these benefits of the intervention and the costs of the intervention, it's very complex puzzle to solve in a country like India. But I think fundamentally right now, we have to go through a hard period in order to really uh, get out of this phase and then think about long-term strategies. And I think it would be wise to think about long-term strategies here. And the good news, as I said, I think that uh, um, there was a study that people have uh, tested a random number of individuals at hospitals with respiratory illnesses, and most of them were, uh, almost all of them were negative. Uh, so I think it had the community transmission and spread probably has not happened at that level. So I think that the measures that are being taken and the government and the local public, and I think the public awareness is a very important uh, component of this war because we need uh, public, private, government, and partnership with scientists who are really working hard on this problem to really conquer uh, this crisis, the defining crisis for humanity. So I'm optimistic that, you know, I, I, I'm also optimistic in human spirit. So I think that I also see that at this time, we are in our best behaviors. We are extending empathy to others. We are coming together virtually because it is suddenly, this virus is an equalizer between everybody in the world. And we are feeling our connection as a human race. So there is tremendous feeling of solidarity and resilience, which is also very uplifting. That's why, you know, I, I cannot remember the last time when I have worked like 72 hours continuously on a report because I, otherwise there was no way to get it out there by Sunday. And uh, I wanted to do that. Dr. Mukherjee, if I could ask, based on your study that you've done, uh, India has taken a series of measures, lockdown in 80 districts, which is unprecedented. Tomorrow they are shutting down all domestic airlines. So that means there won't be any domestic aircrafts taking off or landing anywhere. And they are also ensuring that people just don't step out on the road at all. So they've gone far beyond social distancing. So based on these measures, what are the figures that you have seen in your report? And do you think we might actually see lesser figures because these measures are in place? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And so in our figure four, we did a hypothetical simulation experiment. So I'd have to say that all of this work that we did, you have to take with the grain of salt because there is few data in the early phase. And so I want to say that we are building an online tracker so that every two days our estimates are going to be up, up, uh, updated. And I'm going to sh soon release that website where people can check what our projections are based on the most up-to-date data. because the projections are changing very rapidly. March 16 to March 21 even is a drastic contrast. So uh, we have to be prepared for that. And, uh, but I do think intervention, so in a preliminary calculation that we did, we predicted that without any, the, any of these stri strict measures, the number of cases could go to 2.2 million, uh, 161 per 100,000, that roughly predicts about 2.2 million. But with these measures and containment, you can bring it down to about 15,000. So these numbers, I do not think you should take these numbers as like the truth, the absolute truth, because this is uncertainty in numbers, but the magnitude of reduction that you can achieve is actually quite huge. And so I believe that after this initial phase, as we look at the data for the next couple of weeks are extremely critical for India. So I'll be rather be safe than sorry. So, um, and then revisit, not say predict that this lockdown is going to continue so that the uh, general public starts to panic about their livelihood, about their wages. We should really think about that could create a havoc too, right? If, if people yeah. are feeling so insecure about their earning, how can they uh, really think about fighting the virus? So I think there has to be a strong message about the social collective spirit that we are going to hold each other through this time and get through these two weeks of hardship and because that's absolutely necessary. I think so that's where the role of the state will come in to create that sort of safety net. And as you mentioned, social and economic immunity um, so that people are not, don't panic on the economic front. Um, and Can another thing I want about, to mention, yeah. to re, sorry, in response to Saikat's question, is that sometimes it's very hard to imagine why these measures are being taken. 
but this is a, a contagious process which is growing at an exponential rate. So people think linear, and if you think about, you know, you, you for, from single digits, how quickly you go to hundreds and thousands and millions is just, uh, I would say that even 